Hello out there, and welcome back to another episode of The Metagame. This is the live streaming YouTube series on the Dice Tower, where we talk about not only board games, but sometimes talk about talking about board games. Today, I think, is an episode that's going to straddle the line on the latter half of that equation. And so what we'll do is we'll work together to figure out what that just meant. Um, in doing so, I'll be Chaz Marler, your host for today's festivities, and you will be the YouTube chat who I will be speaking with. In fact, the way that this works, the way that we'll be speaking together, in case this is your first time joining us, is during the show, uh, I will be taking questions, comments, statements, and what have you on today's topic um, and other topics that come to mind um, from the YouTube chat. If you have a statement, question, comment, concern, whatever in the YouTube chat that you want to have highlighted for consideration in the show, be sure to add the hashtag, hashtag TMG for the metagame to your post in the YouTube chat. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to be using my web browser's search tool to highlight those posts so they uh, show up to me uh, easier. And I'll be going through and looking at those first as I scan through the chat for things to talk about back and forth with each other. So today's topic is going to be, what did I title this thing? The uh, top 100 reasons why top 100 lists are the tops, uh, something like that. And here's kind of the mindset I was in. Here's the basis for, for where I'm coming from with this episode. So over the past few weeks, I have been starting my top 100 board games of all time series for here on the Dice Tower. And in doing so, uh, it's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of challenge putting this series together, but it's been fun. And I've gotten to about the halfway point. And the second half of this series will probably take us through um, October. Or roughly. So there's more, you know, there's more episodes, five more episodes to come, obviously, because there's 10 games shown at a time. And it always fascinates me um, the type of content that we're drawn to on the internet or just in media in, in general. I know that the top tens that Tom, Sam, and Z do on a, a bi-weekly basis, I know that those are all always very popular um, and, and get a lot of views, a lot of hits, and deservedly so, because they're a lot of fun to watch. Uh, the top, top 100 games of all time lists, um, those always kind of strike me that as why they are as popular as they are, because usually with those, it's um, you know, one individual rattling off a list of games they like, which seems to me something that wouldn't be as interesting as, say, the top tens that are on a very specific changing subject each time and have the interaction with you know Tom, Sam, and Z playing off of each other while they do it. So. Um, so while the top tens um, are like the most popular content on the Dice Tower channels, it always surprises me that the top 100s always seem to be kind of a close runner-up. Uh, you know, and and uh, is it just because they are another countdown? Uh, is it because it's a countdown that makes it popular? Or is there something more to it? So that's that was kind of my starting point in this whole kind of uh, idea for today's episode to discuss. And, and as I was kind of fleshing out my ideas, I kind of broke it up into three three areas that I'll be bouncing off of, of off of you guys to try and get your feedback on um, the on the different points of view on these three aspects of of media development when it comes to board games and, and really for anything else. So uh, let's let's get started. Um, first of all, again. Top 100 lists, you know, they're very, very popular. Uh, not just on the Dice Tower or just in board game media in general, but top down uh, countdown lists seem to be popular in, in everything. Um, and I forgot to check to make sure that you guys can hear me. So let me just go to the chat real quick and, and check that, uh, test that. I don't see anyone telling me that you can't hear me, so I'm going to be assuming that you can. Um, there we go. So if you can't hear me, let me know, because I'm looking at the chat now. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to continue. So uh, as long as no one's waving their arms trying to get my attention in the chat, I'll, I'll continue on here. So 
Top 100s are almost as interesting to watch as people checking their comments, looking to see if people can see them and hear them. So I know, riveting stuff. So, but, but the top countdown stuff though, like I was saying, not in just board game media, but everywhere. Um, an example of this is, you know, cracked.com. You know, cracked used to be a magazine in the vein of Mad Magazine. Uh, and Cracked, a few years ago, ceased its paper physical publication and exclusively became just a humor website. And since the website has launched, it's evolved and, and grown. And these days, one of the most popular, you know, Cracked is one of the most popular humor websites on the entire internet. And the focus of what they publish seems to be countdown lists. You know, the top 10 reasons why blah, 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 you know, why your refrigerator is secretly trying to kill you and, and stuff like that. And the reason why it's evolved to be a large majority of top 10 type of lists is because that article format uh, you know, organically became the most popular format on, on the website. So it, like I said, it's not just board game media and board gamers that enjoy this format. It's, uh, you know, everyone out there on the interwebs seems to enjoy this type of format. So there is something to be said for the format itself. So, of course, then of course, the, the next logical question is, well, what else is there? Are there other standards in media that, uh, especially board game media, that um, are, are, are popular and, and why? Um, and hang on, just, just one moment. Don't freeze it. Sorry about that. Um, I had a little mini emergency to go go take care of there. That's one of the pleasures of doing a live broadcast. All right, so let's continue on with this, this train of thought here. Um, are there other formats and things that also lend them, themselves to this? And it also got me wondering, you know, is it the format itself that is popular or is there more to it than just the format? So. I've said before, um, in, in when I'm talking about creating media or anything creative like this, that um, in, or, in order to hedge your bets um, towards being successful, the best way to hedge your bets uh, on being a success in those things are to be one of, or a combination of one of three things. Uh, you gotta be the first one doing something, you gotta be the best one doing something, or you gotta do it differently. And and I've, I've said before, you know, who's ever, it's obvious who is first. Being the best is completely subjective. Everyone has different tastes. So the out of those three things, your best bet is to try being different. You know, and that can be, you know, being yourself, not you know, necessarily being different just to be crazy and, and different sake, but really taking your own unique tack on it, which is almost interesting because it seems counterintuitive when we're talking about the formats that people aggregate to online. There seems to be two different trains of thought there, almost conflicting point of views. So, um, so if we focus on just, you know, the, the being different part of that, it brings us back to, okay, how do you do your podcast, your media differently? And what approaches in doing it differently, or, or the same even, are attracting uh, attracting viewers? And I broke that down into the three discussion points for today. Uh, we're finally at the, the, the main idea, is um, breaking it down into uh, your the three things I think that people can be drawn to or repelled by when you're making media are its content, its format, which we've already started to discuss, or the presentation that could draw us to this. So uh, format, like a top 10 list, content, like board game reviews or news, or the presentation, um, a three-way discussion, or one person telling a story, or kind of making a, a interesting type of uh, skit, sketch based off of it. All of these different things can be the kind of presentations. And I've seen people do a really good job with it and others do a really not good job with it. So that's, that's one of the things I wanted to, to kind of see. Um, who's, 
what experiences have we all had in, in videos like this that come off good and bad, and what's the differences between what, uh, what draws us in and what repels us? OK, so first thing I'm, I'm going to do before I get into my, uh, my notes on format, content, and presentation, I'm going to go over to the YouTube chat real quick, because um, I noticed when I sat down at the computer, there were already some posts about the general idea of this topic that were there. So while you guys chew on content versus format versus presentation, let me go over to the comments real quick and see if there's anything in here that's worth kind of kicking off our discussion with. Um, okay, and here we are in our chat log. Thank you very much, chat log. Um, and we start off here, wow, we start off here with a nice kind of uh, six-part little chat thing from, um, uh, from Kabuki Kid, who uh, joins us regularly. And Kabuki starts off with basically saying, uh, talking about top 100 lists and top 10 lists and what have you. Kabuki Kid enjoys those because they provide an insight into what someone experienced in the hobby that they enjoy. And they give several examples, you know, so you get more of a look into their tastes across a wide bunch of different games instead of their thoughts on just one of them, like they would have in just a, you know, one-off review or something like that. That's a really good point. You do kind of start to get that comparison and contrast between multiple games to kind of better formulate uh, their overall tastes when you see it in that format. Uh, there's also the factor of looking to see if they like the th same things that you like. Um, somehow, psychologically, I think we like having reinforcement of our likes in such a way. We want allies in our preferences. Also, if the person making such lists is a reviewer, then it's a quick and dirty way to get a gist of their tastes to see if they line up with your own. Maybe making that reviewer more valuable to you or less valuable, depending on uh, what they say. <laughs> That's really good um, and insightful, as always there, uh, Kabuki. And um, it touches on a couple of things I, I have in my notes here, um, which I'll be getting to in a minute. But the one thing that I hadn't thought of um, is that that's a good point. In doing a top 10 or top 100 list or a large list of games, you do kind of get a, some broad strokes, some broad paint strokes there of their overall tastes and likes, which can help to uh, give you better insight into where that, that reviewer or broadcasting personality is, is coming from. So that's a really, uh, really good points there. Um, Let's see here. Oh, and it continues just a little bit more with the thought of um, mentioning that, again, when it comes to top 100s, top 10s, and stuff like that, uh, one of the things I really look for, though, are the hidden gems. A lot of us really know all the hottest games for the past five years or so. But uh, well, I like learning about a game from 15 years or so ago. And it isn't a game that's not well known, but someone loves it enough to put it on their all-time list. And that is one thing that really garners Kabuki Kid's interest as, as a viewer. And that's, uh, that's oh, and I agree, because I, I know I always, uh, usually when there's a top 10 or top 100 list or something, um, I'll usually like put it on in the background while I'm doing housework or something. And I'll be listening, and when I hear a game that I don't recognize, that's when my ears perk up, and I'll kind of stop what I'm doing and go over and watch uh, that segment on it, that portion of the show. So I can totally see about trying to find hidden gems. And again, not only for getting the wide range of person's tastes, but also with, I guess, a, a top 10, top 100 list, there is the greater chance to see those hidden gems presented more frequently in, in the content. All right. Uh, Michael mentions, I've started doing an annual list, now in its second year, that I post to Facebook 10 at a time for 10 or so days. This year, I also shared it with the board game group on Facebook and uh, in, its entire, in its entirety, in its whole state. Um, I would be interested to know, Michael, um, how those, top t that, those 10 days of top 10 posts how the Facebook reach and response and interaction with those posts compares to just your regular posts. 
Um, again, we know that the top 10 and top 100 videos seem to get a larger audience and a large percentage of views. So I'm wondering if that translates to other media. You know, are people who tweet, people who do Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that, is any media content creator going to be able to benefit from replicating and posting their lists on those other social media formats? Is this like a, an un, un, a stone that hasn't been turned over and looked under? So I'd be interested to find out whether it's, you know, if I can catch it in the chat or later in the comments or even just a, you know, email through the contact form on my website. Um, I'd be curious to see how the viewership and interaction with those top 10 posts compare to your regular other posts that you post um, to see if the, the increased viewership translates over. All right, um, let's see here. Um, I'll take one more little blurb here and then we'll can go back to um, the main uh, topic. Um, one more post here, a follow up from Kabuki Kid, who, who mentions uh, again, these are kind of before we even got started talking. So, this is before the chat got underway. Uh, it just continues the trains of thought with it's a lot of fun to check out the difference in lists between someone who has been in the hobby five years versus someone who's been gaming for like 30 years. Uh, she mentions Jason Levine's top 100 was really fun to watch for that specific reason. His list was different than most because of his long experience and wide exposure in the board game hobby. That is true. And that's one of the things I always think is, is, is neat is to, um, I always enjoy seeing someone who's kind of new um, coming into the hobby for like a year or two and seeing them discover these games that um, kind of have been around in the world of modern hobby board gaming for a long time. And to see their excitement in discovering you know, this uh, Shadows Over Camelot and hearing them talk and discover Shadows Over Camelot, where, you know, to many gamers, you know, that's old hat. And, you know, to hear them talk about this cooperative gaming experience um, and have it be something fresh and new, um, it's always exciting to see that. And with so many games available now, you know, there's a gajillion different co op games that you could choose from. With that gajillion different co op games, uh, available now to see which ones they gravitate towards first. Uh, is it going to be Shadows Over Camelot, which is you know the one of the the first uh, successful ones of those uh, in that genre, or is it going to be other games now and and pu and push games like Shadows Over Camelot uh, to the, to the background? Um, and, and in case you didn't realize, I have my camera and my uh, teleprompter and my lights and everything set up um, between me and my game shelf. Uh, so I can only see a couple of games through the cracks and the holes in all my lights and everything. But surprise, Shadows Over Camelot is one of the games that I can see through these cracks. So if I, uh, I'll probably tie the entire conversation somehow to Shadows Over Camelot or Kingsburg, it looks like. So it'll probably be... Uh, talking about those games a lot today. All right, let's continue on uh, with the main um, thing here. So, uh, format, which we talked about uh, a lot. Format was the first of these three things that I think can uh, draw in or repel people to a certain board game media format. Um, and, and so, with a lot of the formats that we have here, um, we have you know, people talking about uh, the games that they've recently played, you know, game reviews. Uh, the, the main thing that came to my mind was the standard review format. And this is an interesting nut to crack for me. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a second. But uh, first to explain that the, the general board game review format uh, seems to be uh, a quick introduction, overview of the game, then kind of a, an, a more in-depth overview of how the game plays, followed by the reviewer's opinion slash final thoughts. And this can be either one video or typically one or may sometimes split into two videos. One might have the gameplay demonstration and then the other one have the final thoughts. But it's generally that same format. Uh, introduction, uh, overview, final thoughts. And I'll admit that I personally, um, when I came into board game media, I you know I watch I, I watch these board game reviews, especially when I was trying to find you know more games for my own uh, game 
library and, and learn about these games. I'd watch a lot of reviews, you know, the first couple of years that I got interested in the hobby. And, you know, a lot of this board game content and, and these reviews has become the entertainment that, you know, that I, that I watch as opposed to like cable TV or something sometimes. So I will um, watch and consume a lot of this content. But I'm in this interesting position where as a content creator myself, you know, there uh, is the lure of making board game reviews. And I personally, while I enjoy watching and interacting with this content, I find recording a video in the standard board game review format to be excruciatingly dull. Um, again, it's weird. I appreciate others who do it. I enjoy watching it. But whenever I'm making my own, I always have in the back of my mind going, this is so boring. Who's going to want to watch this? You know, try, try something, you know, do something different with it. And that might be the little voice of, you know, first, first best different, you know, be different maybe uh, going off in the back of my head. But uh, that's one of the reasons why I do standard board game reviews so um, infrequently. I think I, of course, you know, with my place in the industry, you know, I, I or the place I want to have in the industry, I feel like I, I should always do more of them and I want to, but I always try to take this nut and find a different way to crack it. Is there a different, uh, is there a different format, a different way to present this information? Is there a different approach that could be taken than the standard? A different way of looking at this and presenting this information that will make people go, oh, I can't believe no one ever thought to do this any before. It becomes kind of a new standard alternative format uh, to doing it. Uh, that's one of the things I always try to keep in the back of my mind and, and take on. So, <clears throat> which makes me wonder if I'm the only person who's thought of that. And I wondered you know, with, with the chat, is there, you know, a reason why the intro overview final thoughts format is the most popular format uh, and what people seem to gravitate to? Is it just like, like the top 10 lists on cracked.com that over time became the standard content on that website? Is there a reason why the uh, intro overview final thoughts format has become the standard in board game me review media? So that's one of the things I wanted to find out uh, in the chat here. And so what I'm going to do when it comes to con, uh, when it comes to format, um, I've already talked about this a little bit in the intro. So I'm going to turn back over to the chat area here and see what we can see about uh, where we left off um, about these, this, and more. Okay, I see some some chats trickling in, and so I'll try to keep the chat from jumping on me. And let's see where we left off here. All right. Uh, boom. There we go. 20 Sided Turtle. Here we go. Hi. 20 Sided Turtle joins us again. It says, uh, just mentions Chaz, loving the top 100 and all your content. Has the increased output made you consider your own variety show? Maybe board game midnight snack? <laughs> um, I, uh, well, that's kind of. Uh, you're kind of watching it in a way. Um, uh, not that this is much of a variety show. It's not much. It's just one guy sitting in front of a cheap backdrop. But um, the, the metagame was kind of my answer to trying to do something that was a little bit more of uh, non review -y but still board game content type of type of show. Um, right now, I, would, I, I will say that um, the increased output you know, has given made me try to think of a lot of ideas, but at the same time, it's kind of tapped out my spare time to be able to um, pursue as many of these different ideas as they, they pop up. So sometimes they've really got to be vetted really strongly, and a lot of them just aren't strong enough of, a, of an idea to um, to say, no, we're going to do this, but said, no, we got to put this on the shelf until we can flesh it out more or have more time to invest. Uh, Striker, uh, ironically, mentions, list the top 100 types of dice that VBug likes to throw at Chaz. Uh, simple list, all of them. There, there you go. There's your, your quick list. It's an all-encompassing list, um, all dice, all the time. Uh, uh, Ava joins us to uh, mention uh, that lists are popular across all media. 
a blogger's first lesson and often uh, they're usually a blogger's first lesson and often the first article that they kind of produce in their first hit. Uh, that is, I, I, and I agree, and I think we've kind of touched on that a little bit. Lists do seem to be popular across all media. And you're right about bloggers, kind of their first lesson can be, you know, make a list. That's going to be a good way to make your first articles and get that information out there. So it does seem to be uh, an intuitive way of communicating that other people can digest uh, really well. Um, let's see here. 20 Sided Turtle um, mentions again that lists make information easier to consume. Oh, there we go. It's following the same train of thought. Lists make information easier to consume, but sometimes the lists can be so long that they bog down. I often start top 100s at 50. Is it still your top top 100 then? If it starts at, sorry, okay, I've distracted myself. Let me, okay, no, let me get back. Um, that is an interesting point. Um, as I've been doing the top 100, the one thing that so far that I did not expect from the the comments section is people who say, this list is great, but I don't really care until you hit 30. Or I don't care until you hit the top 20. And, and I can understand wanting to see, you know, the, 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 the the games they like more, you know, but but um, I'm it always intrigued me to say, you know, where people say I'm liking this list and I'm enjoying this list, but um, you know, yeah, I don't care about all hundred. I just want the, the top thirty or something. But keep going, <laughs> and uh, I, I I did not expect uh, people to have a certain number within a hundred that they really focus on and care about. You know, hey, fifty six and below. I I don't want fifty seven and above. I just want fifty six and below. So that was a surprise. So it does, so um, so starting your top 100 list at 50, that, uh, that that makes that makes sense. I would like to see a top 100 list, you know, started at like you know 12 or 49 or, or something, you know, just some strange strange number. Um, and I'm mistaken. I wouldn't like that. That would bug me. So yeah. Now I'm starting to get distracted again. So let's move on to the next next statement here. Uh, Kabuki mentions, I remember looking forward to the top 100 games list in Games Magazine back in the day. You know, that was the only gaming list I knew of once upon a time. Oh, that is really, that's a really good point. Print media, magazines. Yes, um, that's a really good way because you can have it listed out page to page and stuff. Um, yeah, and Games Magazine had their top uh, games. Wow. I, I used to, when I was like in fourth and fifth grade, I had a subscription to Games Magazine, and I would, oh, I don't have any of them anymore or anything, but I would love to, uh, next time at a, I'm at a thrift store or something, I'm gonna just go to their old magazine section and see if I can track down some copies of Games Magazine and see uh, what the games that they're talking about back then were and see how that's changed. Oh, interesting. Okay, uh, Nyris joins us, um, who, Nyrus Interactive, who told me his real name once and I have forgot it, um, joins us. <laughs> so I apologize, sir. Um, <laughs> but, but, it, but I do look forward to possibly seeing you again at another convention coming up. Uh, but Nyrus mentions, sometimes I like to see lists just to see if someone I like agrees with me or not. You know, I, I don't know why. Hold that thought. I'll get back to that thought in just a couple of minutes um, on my own in my own notes. In the meantime, we'll take a couple more uh, comments here from the from the chat. Daniel mentions lists were pretty much the entire o o over oeuvre. Oh, oh man, lists were pretty much the entire central focal concept of VH1 in the 2000s. Like it's oeuvre. Um, yeah, the, the I didn't watch much VH1, but I do remember uh, that lots of their lists, like you know, the top hair metal bands from the 80s and stuff like that, seeing those kind of in the background. Um, and I wonder if that's what carried VH1 through the 2000s. You know, was, was the popularity of those lists, was it there because that's what brought people in and kept the station going? Or was it just they had all those clips and it was easier to put the, those episodes together? We may never know. So we'll, we'll continue on. Um, uh, oh, David Letterman may have had a hand in popularizing the top 10 list when he was started doing them in the 80s uh, on The Tonight Show or The Late Show, or whichever the David Letterman at nighttime late show was. That is true. Uh, his top 10s certainly had an impact um, 
and, and you know, especially in the comedy industry, it seemed everyone was doing a top ten type format that was a ripoff of, of his for for quite a while. Uh, Jack Knack seventy two joins us to say, watched every single top ten list from the Dice Tower and just finished last week. Wow, that's an endeavor. Top one hundred lists are the next thing that I'm going to watch. Um, oh, that didn't have the hashtag in it. So <laughs> I hope that that wasn't a secret, Jack Knack. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, going to just see if uh, my little highlighting broke or anything there. And let's continue on. Um, all right, it looks like, boom, it looks like we're caught back up there a, a little bit. Yeah, so let's continue on with, all right. So we've talked about format ad nauseum now. So let's switch gears a little bit. And let's talk about the content that's being presented in these formats, okay? Because I talked about, uh, you know, um, the, the, the format being the intro, how the game works, giving an opinion. Um, but what about, you know, the content itself, you know, the, the, the board games and the reviews? That, that's the review, the, that's the way the content, uh, that's the format in which the content of a review seems to be most often presented. So... There's got to be more board game media out there than just reviews, which, you know, I know there is. There's instructional videos. There's, you know, um, oh, there's, well, I have a list here, and I'll look at that list instead of trying to remember the list from scratch. There's, you know, instructional videos. Um, other ideas of that I've seen and things that I've wanted to experiment with, you know, are uh, comparing and contrasting two games or a game and its expansion or, or you know, games in different, the same genre. So comparing and contrasting uh, games uh, to see which one is the stronger for whichever reasons. Uh, thrift store finds. Um, I don't see a lot of that content out there. And I know that there is a thrifting community. And I know there are thrifting videos, but they seem to be more general type of, you know, everything they find at a thrift store type of videos. And I know there's an audience for that. But when it comes to the, and I know on Board Game Geek, in the written community in Board Game Geek, there's a large thrifting audience. But I haven't seen a lot of, I haven't seen a lot of thrifting videos that are as well produced as some of the board game reviews and instructional videos I've seen have been. And I'm wondering if there's just not people producing that content or if I'm just not finding it yet. So um, thrift store content is another thing related to board games that's not a review that's out there. Um, when I actually started the Pair of Dice Paradise YouTube channel, uh, my initial idea was to make videos starting out with a series of the top games that I played with my child as they grew up. And that's still one of the things on, on, on the list a little bit. But uh, that's kind of taking a back seat. And it's always one of those things I want to come back and do more often. But um, it's, it's always kind of a back and forth. And I, I wonder if there's an, an audience for that. It seems like that question, you know, can you list me some of these games, you know, for playing with kids and what you played and why? It seems like that question and that request comes up a lot. Uh, it's just one of the things that, uh, you know, needs to be prioritized, I guess, um, and, and developed out a little bit further. Um, oh, and of course, also a focus on components. Um, not just, you know, you know, this this game came with really thick cardboard chits. You know, not, not just that type of components, but upgrades and you know, swapping out parts for games, things that might be compatible with other games, stuff like that. So uh, com components and, and things like, like, like that. So what I want to know content-wise, like, is, there, is there board game content out there, approaches to board game content, that I'm just completely missing, and perhaps other viewers are completely missing because our focus is so narrow on a certain type of content. Um, and so that's what I wanted to, so that's the part about content I wanted to bounce off. Is there other content out there available in board games to talk about that we're missing? Is there this whole vein that we could mine? And uh, because there might be, you know, some whole aspect of this hobby that's not even being talked about yet that could become the new board game review format that would be really, really interesting to talk about. Um, so I'm going to pop back to the chat here and I'm going to catch up on the chats. Um, so we'll probably have some comments about the previous topic and we'll work our way up to content 
uh, chat topics. Uh, here's, here's where the YouTube comments jumped to, so I think this is where we left off. I apologize if it's not, if I skipped anyone. But David comes in and mentions, when I was first discovering this world of board games, I ate up the quote unquote top lists to learn what I should look into. I find myself fast forwarding the lists now that I've played through most of them. Uh, I agree, it's definitely something that as you become more familiar with the hobby, I think, you know, like I mentioned, I, I, I kind of listen to it in the background while I'm doing housework and I'll wait for those gems to pop up like Kabuki Kid mentioned. Trevor mentions, I watch top lists to see how much I agree for future opinions on buying for myself. Uh, that is, they, they are definitely useful as a market uh, consumer research tool, um, especially when they're talking about uh, like when you have a top 10 list of games in a certain genre and you'll recognize half of them, but half of them you, you don't, and it can help vet out whether those other half are, are worth looking into and getting. Uh, round to it mentions that I didn't used to watch top 100s. Then I found out how to speed up YouTube videos at 150%, it's still comfortably understandable, but comedic, comedic timing does go out the window. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, the day that I discovered that you could speed up YouTube videos was like this watershed moment in my life. It changed my entire life, and I was able to catch up on a lot more. Same thing with audio podcasts. When I realized that uh, you can list, change the speed on an audio podcast, um, it allowed me to catch up on so much more stuff that I wanted to, which is weird because you have these videos and these podcasts that you subscribe to because you want to savor and enjoy. And then human nature, first thing we think is, how can I get through this as fast as possible? That always, always, always makes me laugh, especially like when someone signs up for a class at a community college or something to better themselves. You'll sign up for this class, you'll take the class, and as soon as you sit down in the seat, the first thing you think is, I wonder if they're going to let us out early today. So let's continue. Daniel mentions, I appreciate how different lists by different people are good barometers of their overall preferences and give you a sense of an overall consensus of good games. Again, that's true. It's, I, I'm seeing here that these top 10 lists, one of the reasons they're popular is they definitely have a place in, in helping people see what's out there and how the games that are out there compare to each other and fit in in terms of quality and other games that they're like. So this, this, is, this is really helpful. Equip Kilt mentions, when it comes to presenters, I feel the person should be both passionate and knowledgeable about the subject. Uh, this is what originally drew me to the Dice Tower. It's obviously they love this hobby. Again, hold that thought because presentation is going to be the next thing that I jump back to. Um, but uh, spoiler alert, I do agree with you there. Uh, but we'll come back to that more in a minute. Uh, Kabuki mentions, it's also interesting to uh, a top 100 list uh, from Tom Vassell. From, it's also interesting to see, I think a word's missing there, to see a top 100 list from Tom Vassell from several years ago versus today. And it's interesting how much actually changes. I'm equally interested when I see those, uh, how much actually stays the same too. And I, I, I wonder sometimes if certain games start staying in certain positions just due to nostalgia reasons and it almost becomes they expect it of themselves. Um, I know with my own list that I'm working on, I actually kind of feel bad for some games, and some games I feel like this should be on my list, but it's either been replaced by this other game, or it just doesn't hold up anymore the way I, I thought it would, or I think back on it and think, you know, I don't think I did like that game as much as I did. But there's certain games I want to have in certain places on my list just because of the sentimental value, and I wonder if that affects the placement of some people's games uh, of what they put on their list because of that nostalgia, that sentiment. And I, I wonder if it creates um, kind of the fingerprint of their list that will last, even, even though the game may become obsolete. I, I wonder if it does affect their positioning on the lists. Robert mentions, the top 100 lists tend to be the ones I skip the most and never watch. I do, however, watch lists such as top 20s, um, insert theme slash mechanism here, and as, especially when I'm looking for something specific. Uh, that, that's, that's 
a good point, Robert. Again, it seems like uh, lots of times the, the top countdown lists can be used kind of for consumer market research to find something new and find out if that new thing is worth, fits their own tastes and going out and finding out more about. Let's see here, a couple more comments here. Uh, people will also look at the top 100 games listed on BGG by ranking, and that will help influence what they truly try uh, or what they buy sometimes. Uh, yeah, so BGG, of course, has lots of good ranking tools. Um, BGG ranking, though, I think is could be the topic of a whole nother episode. So I'm not going to delve into the BGG because I want to keep going through the comments at the moment. But that is, that is true. And anyone out there looking, boardgamegeek.com, you know, BGG, um, fantastic website database of like 16,000 board games ranging all time and they have lots of ranking and review and comparison tools um, and listing tools on there. That's definitely an excellent resource when it comes to this type of topic in, in our industry. Um, will it, uh, Michael asks, will a time come that Z, Sam, and Tom can do a top 100 list of their top 10 lists. My head hurts now. I think that if they did that, the internet may start to hemorrhage and it would spell doom for us all. So let's hope that if they ever do consider doing that, that cooler heads prevail. Um, but time will tell. Time will tell, we'll see. Maybe uh, maybe that's how it all ends, you know? Um, hey, and if it is, yeah, I think it'd be a fitting way for us all to go out. Um, infinitely counted down in a never-ending loop of uh, board game black holeness. I think that's the exact terminology that's used to describe that. I think that's what science, how science puts it. Okay, um, Kabuki mentions here, um, it's talking about top 100 lists and format. Here's a very, very uh, relevant comment on this. Uh, I know that Jared Whitley uh, who does the Whitley Pedia segments on Board Game Breakfast? Uh, an excellent chap. Uh, I know that Whitley got flack for his top 100 because he did a different format, a series of 10 different top 10 lists by category, and people rebelled. Side note Kabuki Kid thought it was fine. So, Kabuki Kid's in your corner there, Jared. Yeah, I thought that was really, really interesting um, that there seemed to be a little bit of an uproar because his top 100 list wasn't so much uh, top 100 as 10 lists of 10. And I think he kind of fit them together in such a way they kind of made a sort of top 100, but not really. They still stood out as, as 10 individual lists. Um, yeah, now, is this because he tried something different or the expected format was turned on its head. And people were like, hey, this isn't what I expect. If he had approached it from day one as being, hey, this is going to be 10 lists of 10 and not necessarily a top 100, would people have been like, cool, let's do that? Or would people still rebel and said, hey, we want to see it in this other top 100 format instead? It's a very, very good point, actually, though, of format versus content, form versus function. Uh, the form he took broke what people expected the functionality of his list to be. Um, hmm. That's, I had, and while I was making my notes, I, I hadn't thought of that one. Uh, how far can you stray from the norm of an expected format before it, the wheels just come off and it breaks and it actually repels people? Interesting. All right. Uh, Michael mentions, oh, continuing this train of thought. Michael mentions, uh, back to speaking back to Kabuki, actually, that I think people rebelled because it was more of a series of top 10 lists instead of a top 100. Uh, it's the mo uh, Daniel mentions it's the most popular format because it's easy to do. Um, and it's easy. Oh, and then Celian mentions it's probably the most popular format because it's logical and easy to follow. Uh, yeah, that's I think that's true. I think that uh, as human beings, lists sometimes are easier for us to digest. Um, heck, I know that when there's a top 10 list, uh, I'll you know have, I'll have to go, uh, you know, I'm doing housework with the top 10 list on the back and I'll have to like go out and get the mail or do, do you run the vacuum so I get here. So I can pause that list uh, at almost any point and know exactly in my mind, logically where I'm gonna pick up next. 
So I don't, it's not like I'm trying to learn something where I want to sit down and watch the whole episode all the way through. I can pause and come back logically and pick up almost as if I never left. Um, so that is, that's a really good point, you guys, both of you there, uh, Daniel and Celian. Uh, it's, I think, from the viewer's standpoint, it is logical and, and easy to follow. All right. Um, let's see here. We are going to... Okay. Let's go with our last section of the show. Let's talk about the presentation. Um, what... Why are we drawn to certain media makers? And this may be the most volatile or subjective. That's the word I want. That might, this might be the most subjective portion of this discussion. But I think it is one of the core three legs of the stool that makes up the, this topic. Um, so why are we drawn to certain media makers? Well, first of all, because uh, they're named Chaz. Um, I think that's what draws a lot of people. That's what draws me. That's why I watch my own videos 90% of the time is just, you know, to hear my own name. So, oh wait, wrong list. Let me, yeah, well, that's the, uh, that's a list about something else. Uh, why are we drawn to certain media makers? makers? Well, someone already started mentioning it. So I'll touch on that here as my actual real first point. I think we're drawn to certain media makers because they are someone that we can identify with. Uh, we're drawn, I think, to presenters that reflect something that you see about yourself, a common interest, a common philosophy, their attitude. It's either something in yourself that you see reflected back or some way that you you want to be. I, I think that um, Tom Vassell's earnest excitement for the board game hobby, his his passion and excitement and enthusiasm for these games is, and his energy level, is one of the things I think draws in a large amount of the audience. Way back when I started watching, when I discovered the Dice Tower, it was that very thing. He was entertaining and fun to watch. Not because he was going, ah, doing crazy, silly, weird things, you know, um, which has its place in, in some places, but uh, not for everybody. I'd say not even for the majority of presenters. He just had this genuine presentation of, hey, here's a guy who really enjoys talking about this subject with enthusiasm, and it just drew me in personally. And those are things, uh, his you know, interest in the hobby, his enthusiasm for it, his positivity, um, so the attitude, the philosophy, and the interest level, all of those things were things about the hobby in myself that I wanted to see encouraged as well. And that reflection of those things back, I think is what kind of drew, drew, first drew me in. Which kind of brings me to the second point. Uh, you know, that's what brings you in, but then what, what makes you stick around? And I think lots of times the presenters that we see, the content creators, YouTubers, podcasters, that we, we enjoy spending our time with, because that's really what we're doing, is someone that you would, you find someone that you admire. Um, in different in different ways, you know, admire them for the information that they have that they share, the wisdom that they have that they share, their insight into the subject that you did not realize realize, or their professionalism. And those type of things, um, again, I think the things that we we see reflected back, but also the 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 that kind of goes to the content we want to get out of these people, and if they present. The content in that type of way, I think that also hooks hooks us in. Um, and again, while they're doing that, continuing to engage the audience, uh, in, engage people. Um, there's there's uh, using this metagame series as an example. Uh, there's episodes of the metagame where you know this is live streaming, and I've to me. I've always kind of used scripting, scripting as a crutch. Uh, going without a script has always kind of been a stretch, a way to stretch my own comfort zone. And there'll be episodes of the metagame that I'll get done with. I'm like, yeah, I nailed that episode. I was on, I was working with the, the chat. We had a great discussion. That was fantastic. I can't wait to do it again. And there are other episodes that aren't as great. Uh, ones where I feel like 
Uh, I didn't communicate the ideas I wanted to as effectively. We may have gone down some rabbit trails that uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, and that's just the nature of the live chat discussion format that we have going on here. But there's some episodes that make me go, oh, that one just, I wasn't as engaging. I wasn't on. And so what, so as using the metagame series as an example, uh, as finding a presenter that engages you because they're entertaining, they're humorous, they could be intriguing, they could be surprising, they could challenge you. Uh, heck, they could even be appalling. There's, uh, there's the saying that if you want to be, uh, if you want to be quote unquote famous, you know, or if you want to be a media person, you have two choices. You can either be a hero, or you can be a villain. <laughs> but don't dare be boring. And so someone that engages you, even people that are appalling for some reason, oh, okay, those might still be the people that are talked about. Um, you might think someone is obnoxious or someone is off track or someone has the wrong priorities, but lots of times if that will stand out to people because people kind of in a way, you know, that they will be talking about it. And whether that's good or bad isn't for me to say. If that is your approach to gaining your audience, it might not be an approach that I think is a good approach, but it is definitely an approach that is out there and does get people an audience. Uh, could be a short-term audience, could be a foolish way to get it, could be a way of point painting yourself into a corner um, and be kind of a way to burn brightly then fade away, whereas the person who is more sincere, genuine, and engaging will have a slow burn where they stick around. Um, anyway, so someone who engages you for one of those those different reasons. And uh, finally, in the presentation, I just also want to talk about the uh, technical aspects of, of the presentation, the form versus the function, the content versus the presentation, the actual technical equipment level stuff. Um, there's a board game. Twitter guy, board game media maker. He uh, contributes to the Dice Tower audio podcast sometimes. He has an off and on podcast, which is interesting to listen to. A gentleman by the name of Bill Corey. Um, Bill Corey has a, a, a passion for the board game industry. And um, his, whenever he has a segment on the Dice Tower audio podcast or his own podcast, I always find him interesting to listen to. And one of the reasons act actually is his voice. Um, I really like his actual, the timbers, the sound of his, the audio that comes out of his mouth. And I know that he actually does um, like audio work and DJ work and stuff for a living, I believe. So he works in audio and he understands a lot of the stuff about voice quality, how to broadcast, how to kind of position your body to make your, your voice come out. Uh, he also understands a lot about how people listen to audio, how people consume audio media. Bill Corey, I have to credit with giving me some of the best advice I've ever received when I got into uh, a board game media. About a year, a year or two ago, uh, I was talking to Bill and he gave me some of the best advice talking about video quality versus audio quality. And, he, and whether it be podcasting or videos. And he mentioned that he thought the audio is far more important than your video quality. So if you're starting a YouTube channel, getting the right mics and stuff is a higher priority than getting the right cameras. And the reason why he said this, and he convinced me to the same, is because he said, you know, when you're watching something, you can watch something and you could say, okay, yeah, you know, the lighting's not very good and I'll forgive that. And we cut to this scene and that scene didn't really mesh. And that's okay. The visually, we're a lot more forgiving. But he said, quote, the ear never blinks. And boom, mind blown, right right there. And he's right. We are a lot less forgiving when it comes to audio quality than we are when it comes to video quality, which is why when you're podcasting or even doing videos, um, I recommend that the someone, if you take two podcasters or YouTubers who all things being equal are pretty much the same content, the same presentation, if one has better video and one has better audio, 
I believe that the person with the better audio is going to be the one that more people aggregate to, everything else being equal. Uh, because, quote, the ear never blinks, and it's something we pick up on. So again, just for the quality of presentation, you know, be, you know, be engaging, be entertaining, be challenging to your audience, but make sure your audience can hear you. From that's the only technical, technical nugget of, of experience that I have to to offer there. Okay, let's return to the chat here with the. Uh, lightning round portion of our show. I'm going to try and catch up on the comments here in the next five minutes. And then I'll close out with my final thought on this. Oh, look, I'm repeating the format right here. But let's continue back to the chat. We pick up with Daniel, who mentions that the problem with some of these videos is the rules sum summary usually takes so long that the actual opinion is rushed. Hmm. Um, I can see that, though, from a media developer, why would I rush that? There is no commercial breaks or time schedule when it comes to YouTube videos. The only reason I could see to be rushing is to just to get the video done because you're sick of talking. And if you're rushing your content just because you've been working on the previous content of your episode so much, that's a bad sign for, for a, a content creator. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, though, if you meant something else or, or whatever. Um, let's see here. Um, Kabuki mentions, I actually tend to like watching the lower portions of the lists the most because that is where you tend to find the hidden gems. The I would imagine the, the 50s through 100s on a top 100 list. Um, I agree, it does seem to be more strange, random stuff that's thrown into those higher sections. Um, uh, Brian mentions, I like to binge watch top 100s because uh, I, want, I want you to upload them uh, I want till you upload them all. I wait until you upload them all and then spend an entire afternoon binge watching them. Um, and I can't disagree that that can be a fun way to spend an afternoon um, with this. With that, real quick, ruining the lightning round, that's the one thing I, I kind of wanted to mention about present presentation, what I forgot. Binge watching everything, downloading them all and spending the afternoon. As a content creator, these people the viewers in that situation are spending their afternoon, you know, with you. Um, for decades uh, ago, when I did a lot of uh, web programming and stuff throughout my day, I would put on my headphones and listen to music all day while I worked on the computer. And I started to realize that the musical artists that I listened to were the people that I was spending my days with. You know, I would spend the afternoon with these bands. and. It kind of made me realize, you know, with some of the content of some of their lyrics and such, are these the people I want to be hanging around with? Are these who I want basically to be my chums I'm hanging out with all day, every day? And that's one of the reasons I started listening to podcasts more often. Um, and so it made me realize that when you create videos or audio, those people are taking the time to spend their afternoon with you. You're like their friend that they're spending their time with. And so if you're not engaging and a friend back to them in a way, in the way that you present your content, that's a missing piece of the puzzle that I think some content creators miss out on. These people are, are basically inviting you to become their friend. And um, yeah, how would you engage and how would you talk to someone in that position? Uh, something, something to think about. Uh, anyway, sorry, I'll continue on here. Uh, Sacha, uh, Sasha mentions, uh, hidden gems and personal gateway games tend to be lower on the lists. I agree. Most often, the most interesting part of the whole list, again, Sasha also mentioned, uh, agrees, the 50s down 100s, the lower lower section. Um, Zajko, uh, sorry, S-Z-A-J-K-O, apologize for ru ruining your name there, uh, but mentions, for me, it would be difficult to put together a top 100. After my top 25, everything becomes so elusive. Oh, tell me about it. Uh, Joel Eddy of Dry Through Review said something similar when he put together his top 100. I mean, what was your experience? Yes, totally agree. You hit this certain level, like your top, like you said 25. Your top 25 seems to be written in stone. You know, oh, I can you know, rank this. But then you get to a certain point and the game's like, well, this could be my 75 or my 76th. It just seems a little more ambiguous as you get to the higher numbers. So I, I agree. I've had that same experience. Um, not just you. <laughs> so, uh, and, I, and I, Joel, also. So I think it's a, something that's kind of universal. 
Uh, Trevor mentions, how about a top 100, but not of all games, just top ones, like games I played today or games on this shelf or games in coffin boxes? Um, 100, I can see top, top 10s of that. Top 100s, wow, that's, that's a lot of games to come up with for very specific, unique uh, categories. I think it'd be interesting, but um, wow, that would be a, a bear to put together. Nyrus mentions, it's John. I knew it started with a J, but I didn't want to start rattling off J names because I thought that would be insulting. And in mentioning that probably was just as insulting. So I apologize. Thank you, John. Uh, Nyrus Interactive, John, awesome. Okay, let's see here. Um, going back, continuing on through our lightning round. I think we have time for about three more questions here. Uh, Digital and Dice Podcast mentions, the focus of the list itself is important. If it's about theme, mechanics, style, genre, time needed to play, etc., you know, might either draw people in to watch or void the list entirely. So I, that is true. The theme of the list, there are ones that when I add a uh, top, like when I add a Dice Tower top 10 list to my little watch later on YouTube, um, sometimes I'll sort them around and the ones that seem like a theme that's more interesting is the one that will get played first in that list as they pile up. So I think the theme is definitely important there. And the YouTube comments just jumped really bad. I apologize. So uh, I'm just going to scroll here to, I think we're near the end, so I apologize. I think I skipped a bunch there on accident, but I have four more here. I'll rattle off as we close. Trevin, mention, Trevin mentions um, that uh, oh, he's mentioning something that got skipped. I apologize. But he's talking about thrift market, fleece, flea market thrift store videos with handheld cameras and terrible audio. That could definitely be detrimental to the enjoyment of watching one of those. So, yeah, that definitely, uh, even if you are going around with a handheld camera and stuff, I think there are things you can do as the developer to mitigate that and improve the content. Um, okay, and finally, r round to it is going to round us. <laughs> round to it is going to round out the discussion by uh, mentioning that as an amateur game designer, the dregs of the top 100s, 100 through 50, expose me to innovative mechanisms that may not have been implemented well enough to rise to the top, but inspire my own design work. That's really true. They can be inspiring in that way. I think that is. Fascinating to see these overlooked games. They go, whoa, someone did this in a game. Uh, and uh, Brian is going to end this out here with, uh, that is a great way to think of your audience, which I'm not sure at this moment what, uh, what exactly how that's it's probably the, the friendship type of thing. But um, this has jumped around so much now, I'm completely off. Um, OK, to end this, I was going to end with something special. For everyone who is bothered to stick around, um, I wanted to mention one last thing. A friend of mine, uh, a friend of mine whose whose work I really enjoy, when he started working, he created his list of like ten to twenty bullet points of his rules for his own board game media. And I've done this with other projects and other things. Um, and so, but I never did it for my own board game. I did kind of a different list about this, but not my own rules of. For all of the pair of dice paradise Chaz Marler content is created, I'm going to follow these rules. I never did that. And so I've actually started working on my own list of my own uh, quote unquote Bible for uh, media development. And I have my own, it's personal list, um, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about that. But as I was working on this list, I did discover my golden rule, my core principle that all of these bullet lists point to. And that's what I wanted to share for anyone out there who is making content, board game media, or is considering making board game media, everyone always asks, you know, where do I start? Where do I start? Sometimes. For everyone out there who questions, where do I start? Here is my universal core advice to you. It's three things. Speak sincerely. Emote fearlessly. And edit ruthlessly. You do those three things. You'll be true to yourself. You'll engage with your audience. At least you'll give yourself the best case scenario of achieving those things. And that's what it all boils down to for me. So for now, I've got to go and be in a chair that is slightly different than this chair, but a chair in another location 
nonetheless. So, until I return to this chair, I wanted to remind everyone that for more board game news and reviews and commentary, be sure to subscribe to the Dice Tower and the Pair of Dice Paradise YouTube channels. Click that fun little subscribe button and continue the conversation. In fact, also continue the conversation at uh, on Facebook and Twitter, where we're always posting more information and continuing to try and engage with the audience on Facebook and Twitter as well. But until then, I have been Chaz Marler, along with the YouTube live streaming chat, playing another episode of The Metagame. Until next time, thank you for joining us, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.